Hi everyone, welcome back to my series of videos on the Chinese Civil War. Today I want to talk about the two uh, opposing armies in the C Chinese Civil War, the Nationalist Revolutionary Army or the NRA. Oh, that's a catchy acronym. I wonder if anyone else is using it. And also the CCP Army, which is known as the People's Liberation Army or the PLA. And I also want to talk about how their various strengths and weaknesses and how they appealed to the peasant population. So firstly, the Nationalist Revolutionary Army, or the NRA. The NRA army was quite big. It composed of three million troops, but it was plagued by several problems, and this led to their downfall in the Chinese Civil War. Firstly, there was a lack of organisation, and discipline was a constant problem, and this largely rooted in the two types of officers that were in the NRA. Firstly, there were those that graduated from the Nationalist Military Schools, Chang's own um, military schools, and then there were the locally recruited officers who saw bribes as part of their income and were very easily corrupted. Obviously, the Nationalist Military School um, officers were not so much of a problem, although they did cause problems in trying to curry favour with uh, Jiang, and they were often uh, infighting and not providing accurate information to Jiang so that they were able to be the most favourable in his eyes. But the Greater problem were the locally recruited officers. So local officers who um, were recruited and who were corrupt, they really wanted positions concerned with supplies and resourcing. And the reason why they wanted position with supplies and resourcing was that they were simply on selling supplies that were meant for soldiers, food, uh, weapons and other resources and um, just sold that to um, shonky salesmen on the side rather than giving the supplies to their soldiers. And this caused starvation for many of the ordinary soldiers. In addition, because these local officers were so self-serving and uh, their own safety and self-interest was their primary motivation, they avoided any risk to themselves. So often when they did cross paths with CCP forces, they were often very quick to surrender or defect, and they weren't really that interested in engaging in any hard battle on behalf of Jane. So this caused a number of problems. Firstly, there was a high level of desertion in the NRA army. The majority of NRA forces were conscripts, and what they did to get NRA soldiers was that they would visit villages with recruiting squads and round them up in village raids, and basically you would be executed if you didn't join the NRA. So you can see that there was already a loyalty problem with the every, everyday soldier. Um, so this led to a desertion rate of about one-tenth of total troops per month. And it got so bad that the NRA officers would tie their men together in bunches of about 12 and they would stay tied together in a bunch for the entire time, including while they were sleeping or resting and when they were marching, they would wander along in these tied up little bunches. Um, in addition to that, the NRA was notorious for brutality. 40% uh, of conscripts deserted in basic training and 20% of them starved. And in addition to this, they had a system of individual responsibility, basically, that you as a soldier are responsible for the person in front of you and also for the person behind you. And if the person in front of you or behind you deserted or did something wrong, you would be punished by taking away your rations or beatings. So there was a very toxic uh, environment for people to be in, which didn't breed much loyalty for the NRA. Obviously, this led to a very uh, low morale along the, around the ordinary troops. Uh, in addition to this, the NRA was brutal towards peasants that they came across. In addition to the conscripts, there was also many soldiers who had previously served warlords. And so they proved the saying of violence begets violence in that they had probably witnessed and learned very violent techniques from their warlord leaders in the previous life and so they applied those to any peasants that they would come across. They uh, they engaged in looting, rape and torture that they had learned from their warlord um, leaders previously and it generally is said that this was the norm for the NRA rather than the exception to the rule and uh, this brutality towards peasants was carried out as they moved through the territory so they're not really enamoring themselves with the peasants so much. Although they did have a strength, the NRA, and that was their sheer size. They did outnumber the PLA 
three to one in 1946. Moving on to the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, this is the CCP's army, and they were more popular with the peasants uh, initially after World War II when there was a sense of lawlessness as um, Jang's focus was on what to do with the Japanese. There were bandit gangs roaming the countryside and the PLA did make effort to crush those bandit gangs and free um, peasant populations who were at their mercy. Um, and this did lead to some people joining the PLA, both locals who were impressed with how the PLA had come to the aid of their local village and also the bandits who had been crushed by the PLA who were given no other choice. Basically, they needed to join the PLA or they would be executed. However, this did have a weakness. Um, they often did not recruit battle-hardened soldiers in the early years. And this did cause a problem because they had a lack of technical know-how and a lack of military knowledge, even though they did have some cap captured Japanese weapons, including tanks and planes and some Soviet-provided weapons. These went unused because they just didn't have the technical knowledge to operate tanks or planes. And so uh, they needed to find a solution to that. And the solution was that they incorporated 200,000 strong Manchugo army, the army that was uh, engaged in, in a battle with Japan for Manchuria. Um, uh, and they also, uh, but that wasn't always voluntary. Some of that army was loyal to Jane. And so they were offered the choice of execution or joining the PLA. And same with the Japanese POWs that had been captured in Manchuria. They also were offered the choice of execution or becoming tactical instructors. And those people were used to upskill the more, uh, the well, upskill the less professional PLA soldiers. Did this all equate in popularity for the PLA? Mm. Not always. The CCP could at times, as I've mentioned several times actually, they did engage in execution so they could be seen as equally as brutal as the, uh, as the KMT or as the NRA. Um, but Jang did put peasants offside. After the Second World War and after Japan had uh, was defeated and was no longer occupying uh, China, he sided with the landlords. What he did was he helped reclaim land that was being held by local resistors. So in the vacuum that's left behind after the war, many peasants occupied um, landlord land. And um, despite Jang's promise in the three principles of the KMT of land reform, he did um, support the landlords and send people to help um, the landlords reclaim their land from peasants who had seized it in the, in the time period after the Second World War. Um, this combined with the brutality of the KMT recruitment and tactics, when we talked about the re recruitment gangs and, um, and the brutality of which their soldiers were treated, the starvation, the desertion, etc., led to the KMT and the NRA to be very, very unpopular with the peasant population. However, this didn't automatically trans translate into support for the CCP and the PLA, um, although they were... Um, liberating the um, peasantry from either CCP or um, or roaming gang rule. They often did so with brutality and this uh, off, well this did lead to the execution of many landlords. over one million landlords were killed by the PLA in this time period. and although pe peasants joined in somewhat, enthusiastically this was often described as doing that as wanting to revenge uh, to gain revenge against the landlords rather than because they loved the CCP. In addition the CCP although they set up local committees for which representatives from the village could join they had to have a CCP rep and that CC rep could veto or change any decision as they saw fit so they didn't actually have true representation However, the CCP did recognise through that process that the hatred for the landlords was the key to gaining the um, peasants. And so they implemented struggle sessions, which will become an ongoing theme um, for Mao's China. Basically, it's like public ridicule and um, humiliation. And so they would lead landowners into um, public areas and they would um, scream obscenities at them, whip the crowd into like this 
real frenzy of hatred against the person who is up for the struggle session. They would be violent towards that person and often led into execution of that person. But they could go for like a marathon. Mao sent his own son, who he thought was a bit soft, out to view some of these struggle sessions. And he saw a five-day session uh, where he said he basically wept afterwards because it was so brutal. Even though he didn't agree with what the landlord stood for, he thought it was so brutal and animalistic that it really affected him for the rest of his life. So the CCP were seen as equally as brutal, but at least they were able to direct peasant hate towards landowners. And this was the difference between the KMT. The KMT supported landowners, whereas the CCP didn't. And so the CCP seemed to be a better option for peasants. As I just mentioned, Jang did support the landowners and he did that aside from um, helping them to reclaim their land. He also sent squads to accompany them to claim back rent for any of the time that peasants had occupied the landowner land. And if you didn't pay that back rent, the squad would uh, beat and execute those who refused. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned before, the PLA was equally as brutal, um, but they were able to exploit this. In addition to Jang supporting the landowners in in um, villages that he conquered with his army, those who had joined the CCP were buried alive in some cases as a message to warn against joining the CCP. And even though Mao was as brutal, uh, propaganda units were created by the CCP and the PLA and they would drop pamphlets over enemy lines. And it wasn't emphasising the brutality of the KMT because they knew they were just as brutal, but it did emphasise the moral superiority of the CCP. Yes, we are brutal, but we are brutal for the right reasons. We're getting rid of the landlord oppression, whereas the KMT is brutal because they want to maintain oppression of the peasant class. So thanks very much for listening today. I hope you understand a bit more about the two opposing armies and what their strengths and weaknesses were and how they appeal to the peasant class. Uh, next video, we're going to start getting into the course of the war, some of the important battles and how it unfolded and led to the success of the CCP and the PLA. Thank you very much. Bye.